Lift 99 box. I uh, click on the link in chat, use the, uh, the password lift 99 rocks. And we're going to be using Miro. I, you guys are seeing this as a shared uh, screen, but I want you to actually not have to look at the screen if you have the opportunity and actually interact with the questions I'm going to have for you. So this is going to be a workshop and there's going to be a, uh, ideally a lot of interaction. You're going to be recognizing some patterns that you are using in a daily basis. Um, and not realizing what they are. So this is, I, hopefully this whole thing is going to be, number one, it's going to be simple. That's, it's incredibly important for me to make things simple because if they're complex, things don't get done, right? So keep things simple. And the second thing is that they are utilizable right away. So we go around and teach these concepts to companies and they can, so they can take their teamwork and their leadership to the next level. So now that everybody's on here and doing the practice board, the first thing that I always have people do, uh, we always talk about how important uh, uh, meditation is. So uh, I, I, so, well, actually, let me back up. My name is Felix Lin. I'm from Los Angeles, California. I've been, uh, I was introduced to this community by Ariane, and it is a gift and honor to be here to serve you today. I love working with entrepreneurs. I've been doing that for like uh, almost a decade now, just uh, doing coaching and, and mentorship for, for people starting off. Um, and so, but the first thing that we teach them is that you've had a long day. There have been challenges that you've been working on today. There have been stressors that you've been working on. And a big key to this is to, uh, uh, is to be able to take a moment and just breathe this in and out, right? So we're gonna do this process called box breathing. It's a very easy way to do some quick meditation. What we're gonna do is we're gonna breathe in through our nose for four counts. We are going to hold for four counts. We're gonna breathe out through our mouth for four counts. And then we're gonna hold for four counts. We're gonna do this for about two minutes. And I want you to concentrate on the breathing. Just focus on the breathing itself. And just watch as you focus on the breathing, feel how your body will just start relaxing into it. And just encourage your body to do that even more. In that place, we make better decisions. In that place, we get better results. Right, so breathe in for four through your nose. Hold for four. Breathe out through your mouth for four. Hold for four. Focus on your breathing. Breathe in for four. Hold for four. Breathe out for four. Hold for four. Breathe in for four. Hold for four. Breathe out for four. Hold for four. Breathe in for four. Hold for four. Breathe out for four. Hold for four. Breathe in for four. Hold for four. Breathe out for four. Hold for four. One more, breathe in for four. Feel all your muscles just relaxing. Hold for four. Breathe out for four. Hold for four. Awesome, okay, so follow my cursor over to here. I'm gonna give you a quick intro about me. So I've had over 20 years of running placement firms uh, tens of thousands of interviews, thousands of placements over that course of time. We still do some recruiting today, um, although our main focus is doing the training and coaching now. So, but I've also had 20 years of working in personal development, working with Tony Robbins. I'm a senior trainer for his organization, and we work with thousands of people. Uh, well, Tony's worked with millions, but uh, for, uh, for me, I've worked with thousands of people on teams, um, running into whatever challenges they had and helping them get past it, right? So what I thought along the way about three years ago, 
I thought, why am I really good at making placements? Why haven't we really good at understanding? Like, so all of you pretty much have, uh, how many of you need to hire at some point, right? If you can just raise your hand or click a one in chat or like, you know, whatever you have to do to, to, to let me know. But hiring is so painful for everybody. It is one of like, and very, and there's been no, there's no training on interviews. There's no training on how to do, like how to actually find out if somebody is right. So what people do is they just throw more people at the interview process, hoping that maybe it's going to be a good fit, right? But that's a story for a different day. But out of that came a understanding of how I was really great at making these matches, right? How can I learn somebody's personality within an hour, go out and do a search, start finding like really great matches, and then having people stay with companies for five, seven plus years, right? And so out of that came this, what I'm going to teach you today. Uh, these concepts behind how to create elite teams and how to create elite teamwork and elite leadership. Okay. And so what there's a Harvard study back in the nineties, it's a small study, pretty inf informal that companies that empowered their leadership and empowered their teams had a 756 net profit increase. And uh, I haven't put the link on, on this, uh, this, uh, this specific thing, but I'll, I'll put, I'll add the link later into the mirror board. How many of you would like to have 756% more net profit? Not just gross revenue, but the actual net profit, right? Give me a thumbs up. Oh, everybody's off camera, <laughs> but yeah, give me a thumbs up. We're using your digital thumbs up as well. Yes. I, when I heard this and I looked up the study, they did the, they did a small study with 12 companies and they followed 20 that did not. And this was the difference, right? And so the key for us as leaders is to, re, to continue to empower our people. So right now, right click, create that sticky, follow me over here on the mirror board. And you don't have to do this, but if you can, I think it'd be better. Right click, create a sticky note, give me a number from one to 10, as far as what you feel your culture is right now. And then move your sticky underneath this frame, just put it down below. So what is the effectiveness of your current culture? How do you feel it is? Right click loaf, give me a number from one to 10. For those of you who are still on the left, you can just uh, right click and drag the screen and move it, uh, move your mouse left and then you'll move to the right on the screen. You can catch up to us over here. If you can put the number underneath frame 49. Yeah, you can drag, perfect. Some very, obviously some very on, honest answers here for sure, right? Nobody ever wants to talk that they're not doing well in something. <laughs> and I appreciate that honesty. That's important. That's incredibly important in a leader. So what is culture, right? Culture is something that people talk about, but they never really define. And some people say it's the values. Some people say it's this, like, but yeah, it's values, but values are like, you know, Enron, if you know that that company in the US, Enron was that company that tanked horrifically. They were selling, they were like, you know, just doing shady business everywhere and billions of dollars was, were lost overnight because they went, bank, they went out, they, they, they got shut down, they went out of business. But that, you know, one of their biggest values was honesty, right? And I think they also had integrity, but they were cheating people out of money, incredibly cheating people out of money. And so it's not just the values, it's the standards, right? And I know that you can recognize this right now. Are the standards that we hold as the leader of the organization are a ripple effect through the whole organization, the things that we are taking action on, and more importantly, the things that we're not taking action on, right? Are there behaviors right now in your organization that you know that need to be handled, but we find ourselves too busy to go deal with it? And so a lot of the companies that I work with, the teamwork challenges are because the standards aren't being, are no one, number one, they're not apparent. They're not visible to everybody. And, that, and the second part is that they're not enforced or they're enforced differently for different people in different groups, right? Enforced in a much different way. So understand is the standards that we're looking at. We're gonna create new standards today. So, and we're also going to define culture in a different way today too. So I'm gonna show you some really easy ways to do it to clear up a lot of your teamwork issues. Okay, so we're gonna go through three steps 
to create an elite teamwork. Keep moving to the right with me. I see your cursors over to the left. Keep moving to the right. Remember, you can scroll in and out using your mouse button. Step one, let's define our ideal culture. All right. There are three. Th I'm going to show this frame to you in a second. There are three major frameworks of every company. If you look around the world, I use US companies as an example. So I'm going to hold on, let me un let me click this off here. This is not happy for me. Why is this not doing this? Oh, so oh, uh, somebody else is clicking on the frame. That's why. Okay. So here are the three different culture frameworks. There are companies that use competition to drive productivity. Companies that use competition to drive productivity. Companies like these are like companies that you'll recognize are Amazon. I think you probably recognize Netflix, right? And we have another company here that used that uh, used to be huge in creating appliances and like you know they do turbines, General Electric, right? So these are three major companies that fit in the competition model. So General Electric has uh, under Jack Welch, they um, they re highly rewarded their top ten percent of performers, and every year they would fire their bottom ten percent. So that means that if you were a salesperson and you were even like doing well, like you know you're above quota, if you were still in the bottom ten percent. You were let go, right? They they feel that by driving the level of competition to that level, that they will get the best productivity for their company. Now this now here's the thing: it does not mean that other other types of companies do not have competition. That's every company has competition. These companies use competition at this level to drive their productivity, right? So the second kind of company is almost the opposite. They use teamwork to drive their productivity. So these are companies like Walmart for in the US, Walmart and Starbucks. And so like, for instance, if you're at Starbucks and you get a, uh, uh, you get like, so that the, the, give the store a goal, right? And if the store hits the goal, then everybody gets compensated the same. And now that's very like, you know, so that's kind of weird to me. So like, you know, hey, if Zena and I were working together, if Zena was like, you know, hey, you know, Felix, I did like, you know, 20% more than Felix this time. But that's okay because I know Felix has my back, right? I know that he's going to like, you know, step up for me. I love working with him on a team. You know, he lifts me up. You know, we work really great together, right? And so we're okay. She's okay with like having the same, getting the same reward. If you put an ultra competitive, like this competition person in that environment, this is like, well, Zane is like, oh, I did 20% more than Felix. Why am I getting paid the same, right? I should be getting compensated at a much higher level because I beat him. And so this person now gets labeled as a bad apple in that environment, except she's not. She's just in the wrong place, the wrong framework. Does that make sense? There is a right framework for everyone. Whether or not you hired the right person is another, is another thing. So if you're having these kinds of like of interactions and, and grievances and, and friction and frustration, it's because that person has a different culture framework. Most likely, that's one place to look. This is the most important place to look. I'll give you an example. I had a friend who is a very big teamwork guy. He is a senior vice president of project management here in Los Angeles. He's probably making around US around 300K plus, right? He decides he's gonna leave Los Angeles. He's gonna move to Seattle and he gets a job with Amazon. Amazon is a competition-based company, right? In Amazon, they do they have teamwork, but I'm going to beat you, right? If Zayna and I are in the same group, we're going to be competing, right? I'm going to be better than you all the time. My goal by the end of the year is to always be better than you, right? In maybe a friendly competition, I always have this wanting to be better no matter what, right? So he joins that organization. And within six months, he's gone. He leaves. It's the worst, the absolute worst environment he's ever been in. And even Amazon doesn't know how to add. They, they're, by the way, they are like, if you obviously, if you follow Bezos, he's a crazy competition guy. But their total teams don't know, even know how to ask this one simple question. And imagine you hired somebody at that level in your company, right? In six months, all the time you spent recruiting, the money you paid to recruit that person, all the time you spent with all the people bringing that person up to speed and now you have to replace that person what does that do to an entrepreneurial company yeah i know you've all gone through this pain before because i've been through it too right this is why i teach this now is because nobody teaches this i don't understand why not 
but understand who you are. So the third one's called individual merit, right? Individual merit doesn't mean that you don't want to work with other people. It just means that you believe like you, the value that you add should be compensated as such, but I don't need to be better than Zena. I just want to be the best of myself. I want to have fun. I want to enjoy. I don't need to be micromanaged, right? And so for the individual merit people, the companies like this are Zappos, Salesforce, right? Those are two major companies that are very individual merit. They hire very resourceful people. They don't like, they tell them here's the goals and they just go get it done. So which one are you? Put your name in a sticky and stick it underneath what you are. If you're in between teamwork and individual merit or you're in between like some of them, you can put it in between two. The right click, create a sticky, put your put yourself underneath, put your name underneath one of these, one of these three. There's nothing wrong with the three. It's just what you recognize yourself and are you hiring the right people? Because you're going to be like typically the competition and teamwork people are going to be very frustrated with each other. Does this make sense, by the way? Give me a digital thumbs up in your in Zoom if this makes sense to you. Remember, really simple stuff. There's only three things, and you can ask people when you're interviewing them what they like the most. I'm mostly number three, by the way. I like to give people outcomes. I want to hire extremely resourceful people, give them outcomes, and let them do it their way. But I also have to recognize that I need to let them do it their way, right? Because sometimes there are other, so we'll talk about some other things that kind of get in the way of that. Okay, so now we're getting everybody on here. This is great. So, so uh, I think it's uh, Margarita. So yeah, so the right way to ask this is just to do it exactly how I just did it with you. Explain the three. By the way, this mural board will stay up so you can come back to this, right? Explain the three and ask them what they thrive in. because you want somebody that thrives with your style. If I wanna be number one, I wanna go to, I wanna work with Kirill, right? I wanna go work with, uh, with him, I guess, as I, I, would, I would assume it's a him. Um, I wanna go work with him because he's going to be driving, right? He's gonna be like, we're gonna have lots of competition and we're gonna have a great time. So I'm gonna enjoy that. But I'm number three, I can live with both the other ones, but one and two, don't usually work out very well together. Okay, so now we got that. You guys have seen that. Now let's go to the next one. So that's the question. Are you hiring the right? So anybody that you hire from here on out, you ask this question. You explain the three. They think about it. And they just tell you there's no way to lie. And be very wary of hiring the one that's opposite from you. That's all. Okay. All right, now there are six leadership styles. They've done huge studies on this, like tens and thousands, maybe hundreds and thousands of leaders. There are six styles that every one of us use at some point or another, six major styles. Here they are right now. I'm going to explain these styles to you in a way, and you can probably recognize them right now. They are in a way that they, there are ways to do them in a revert to get great results and be resourceful. There are also ways to do these that leave a trail of burned bodies behind, right? So let's start with the first one here on commanding. Great commanders do the following. They're great at giving outcomes. They're great at giving details. They're great at telling people exactly how to do something. They're also great at potentially mobilizing people as well, right? Getting people moving. Now, the downside of commanders that we've experienced are they are micromanaging all the time, right? They are very, they can be extremely intense. And they can also potentially yell at people. Oh, one other thing that great commanders can do, they can be also be very direct, right? They don't beat around the bush. They're very direct, all right? So the second one is affiliative. The affiliative leaders are all about creating relationships. They love having people go out and get happy hour together. They're having lunch together, right? They're doing things for the organization to help grow those relationships. Some people don't want that. They come to work. And they're like, I don't, I just come to work to work. I don't need to make friends here. I've got plenty of friends at home. So they don't care for this style. But then there are also some affiliative leaders that's, hey, Zaina's like, oh no, I just got to get this thing done at lunch. No, Zaina, we need to, everybody's coming to lunch together, right? We're all going out together. You need to come to lunch together. Forget about what you're doing. I need to get this done, right? So they interfere with productivity with as many, as many activities as they set up. 
Sometimes the failure leaders go overboard. Okay. So the third one is coaching. Everybody recognizes coaching. The great coaches are ones that talk about the result. They talk about what you did great. They talk about specifics of what you did great. They also talk about what you could do better. Right. So they can talk about like the, the, like, uh, um, uh, like, but they give you specific actional items for you to get better. There are two really poor kinds of coaches. Coaches. The first one is everything's great, and they give you nothing to work on, or they give the team nothing to work on. Or the the second kind is the worst. Is the hypercritical coach, the one that always finds something wrong. Like Zena is creating all these great programs for like to help the Ukrainian community and to help coach Zena. You misspelled something on the website. That's what the hypercritical coach says, right? So that's what I'm saying. Sorry, Zane, I'm using you as, as the example. <laughs> but they would come back, you know, oh, we just signed up like a thousand people to help them. Well, no, no, you misspelled something, right? That's what they come back with. But they don't know any different because that's what they've been taught their whole lives. That's what they think gets the job done. That's what they think is the most effective, right? Very few companies, especially at the at the entrepreneurial level, have any kind of leadership training. Very few. And it's critical to train your leaders as early as possible to get the best results. OK, so democratic. So the democratic leaders are great at getting ideas from their teams, right? They pull their teams, get ideas, and then they ask their teams to like, you know, then they make a decision based on, on that on those on all those ideas. The farthest democratic ones are the ones that allow their teams to make to vote and make the decision, right? Now, where democratic leaders go wrong is making the decision. Some democratic leaders drag the decision for weeks and everybody's behind, right? And where everybody is sitting there, why hasn't this decision been made? The fifth one is pace setting. The pace setters you can recognize are the bosses you've had that are in before you, like always there before you get there, and they never leave before you leave, right? And they're always pushing productivity and output. The best pace setting leaders are the ones that do it to help, number one, to help people grow, number two, to do it in a way to create more efficiency as they, as they push more output, right? The worst pace setting leaders are the ones that you know, you got everything done at noon. You got really efficient with your job. You found really great ways to do it. You got done at noon. You're like, I can take a half a day off. They're like, no, sit back down in your chair, pretend like you're working because, you know, like, I don't care if you're not doing anything, just sit there so that everybody else sees that you're there, right? Those are the worst pace setting leaders. And I think we've all had one of those. The last one is the visionary. The visionary leader loves to create ideas, right? In fact, I would assume that almost everybody in here has a big chunk of visionary. Otherwise, you wouldn't be in creating, like doing the painful work of being an entrepreneur. You're all visionaries, for sure. Visionaries, where they go wrong is when they have too many ideas too fast and it freezes up their team. Because as we think of idea after idea after idea, and we keep dropping them onto our team, because in our minds, it's so easy to be able to just, hey, let's just get it done. We forget to check in with them to see, are they actually getting these, like, do they actually have the capacity? Do they have the resources to make that happen, right? So now that being said, in our sticky, what are the top two for Elon Musk? When you think of Elon Musk, what are your top two? So right click, play, create a sticky, type in the top two you think Elon Musk is. You can create the sticky near the uh, near frame 62 underneath leadership styles. It's easier if you do it off the frame. Yeah, down here. Yep, perfect. Just type in the sticky itself, what do, you, what do you believe his top two are? Commanding visionary, commander visionary. See, notice how you all see this, right? Some, some people are pace setting visionary, right? It depends on what we see from the media, because obviously, unless you guys already know him, I don't know him, but I can only use what I see from the media. I think obviously visionary, right? Because if you want to go to Mars, you don't go like in, in the US, we have options. You can either go to like NASA, you can go to Virgin Galactic, you can go to Blue Origin, right? But if you want to go to Mars, there's only one company you send your resume to, and that's SpaceX. 
he set that vision so strong that you know there is no other choice there literally is no other choice if that's what your dream is now some people say commander absolutely some people say uh pace setting absolutely he sleeps like you know in his office most of the time it seems and i <laughs> it's like i don't know if he's still married or not but <laughs> that's not that's like that that's his commitment right so here's the next question what are the styles of your favorite bosses think of the bosses you've loved you absolutely adore these leaders they mentored you they guided you they brought you up they were patient what were their two best what do you respond to the best right click a sticky note in here what are the two that you love to be led by No, no, just just for you. Not this is this is not anybody else. Yeah, somebody wrote best for employees. What did you love to be led by? Who are your favorite? Think of your favorite bosses, right? And I'm asking you this to you in a way that you can ask people that you're interviewing. You can ask people on your team because you need to know what they love to be led by. Marvel, you never had a boss? That's amazing. You can use any organization, by the way. If you've ever played sports, you know, you can use coaches, you can use parents, if you really, really were inspired by their, or even other leaders that are out there, right? What inspires you by looking out into the world and seeing different leaders? So I want you to notice that all of you have different things that are important to you, right? This means that everybody in your organizations right now have a different list. Are you giving it to them? So this is the next question. What are the two that you enjoy using the most? What are the two that you enjoy using with your teams? It may not be the same as your other bosses. Maybe it's the same. Maybe they had that kind of influence on you where now you are doing, you know, that's a lot where a lot of us get our leadership from is from our previous mentors and leaders, right? So what are the two styles you enjoy using the most? So I love covering these six with companies because there are, I haven't really run into any company that has actually re recognized that there are six that this research has been done. And it can be a big eye opener for people, right? But there's only six that you have to learn as a leader. That's the great part. And if you are able to do all six, then you can have massive effect with your teams. Now, the next question, what are your two weakest styles or one or two? Maybe you do five of them great. Maybe you do all of them great. Maybe you are that well-rounded of a leader. But typically we have styles that we don't go to. For me, that was been, like in my life, it's been commander, mainly because I've always been a pleaser type personality. I've always wanted to make people, get people to like me. So commander was the last thing I ever went to. But now that I recognize it, I have to do better because some people need my commander. So what is the weakest? So the goal here is you have six and you need to be up to speed in all six. In fact, like down the road, if you want, come back to this mirror board and make a sticky or just do it somewhere where you rank yourself on a scale of one to 10 in each six of these styles. People ask me, what's the most important style? The most important style is what the person in front of you needs. So if you do have a weakest style that you don't use very much, it's like a muscle, you need to find somebody to either coach you in it, find some examples, practice it in a very resourceful way, right? Because the next slide, are you using styles in an unresourceful way? 
Are you being a terrible commander yelling at people? Are you being someone that is micromanaging beyond belief? Are you an affiliative that is getting people to do too many activities and interfering with their productivity? Or you're trying to use inter- like affiliative with a person that just doesn't care for it. Are you the democratic leader that does not make decisions on time? Are you the visionary that overloads their team? Are you the pace setter that is getting people to do things just to do things and just grinding because you believe that's what business should be? Or are you actually rewarding innovation and efficiency, right? This is where leaders, this is where your self-honesty is most important. Recognizing where we're not being our best, but that's why you're here, right? Yes, hopefully to learn something, hopefully I'm teaching you something, (laughs) hopefully you're learning something and you can actually put it into practice right away. If that's the case right now so far, give me a thumbs up if you could. If this is, if this is, these are things that you, that can be useful for you. And also it's very simple, right? The whole goal is to keep it super simple. Okay, so now that we have that, we're going to move to the set, the next, then the third piece. The, these are the, this, these are the three that I think that are the most important in understanding in your teams. There are more. There are like 15 that I go through in an in actual interview, but these are the three that I think are the most dominant and are most important. What are your superhero powers, right? When you talk to people, it's talking about where their joy meets what they love, and the, what they love to do meets their, uh, their value add. I'll give you an example. So when my son was four years old, Somehow he found out about the Titanic, right? Does everybody know what the Titanic is? The, the, the boat, right? Everybody knows, okay. So the Titanic, so he found out he's four. I don't know how, but now he wants to consume everything about the Titanic. And so he, he's like wanting to watch the National Geographic shows on it. He wants to uh, put the Lego set together. Like he's got like four or five different like Titanics that he put together when he was really young with his grandparents. His grandparents saw how much he loved it brought him this huge book on the Titanic. So it's got pictures, it's got words, you know, it's like, so he's like, he's going through at least four years old, he can't read, but he's pointing at the words in the book and asking us, what does this word mean? What does this word mean? What does this word mean? And he learned, taught himself how to read because he was so excited about learning about the Titanic. At this, he's 12 now, he can tell you how many, how many, exactly how many people were on, how many people survived, how many people died. He can tell you he's built the type, he's got this program called, I think it's like structure works or something like that, where you can build things. So he's built the Titanic. I don't know how hundreds, thousands of times to rebuild how exactly it sunk. He's so excited about this. Do you guys remember a time you were so excited about something, right? Kind of the way you actually started, a, started your, your companies. Maybe you've forgotten. Some of us have forgotten. He can also tell you that you know, the, the Titanic had four smokestacks. The fourth smokestack was fake. They didn't, they, the Titanic only needed three engines to get to up to, to be faster than every other cruise ship. But they felt that if they had a four, they only had three stacks, they'd be seen less than other cruise ships. So they built a fake fourth <laughs> stack to make sure that they had the same amount. How would anybody learn this? And I asked him, how do you know this? He goes, well, I can read now, dad. <laughs> what, are the, what are your superhero powers? What do you love to do over and over again, even for free? You just do it. You can tell this is something that I'd love to do, right? And this is something where I feel that is so important for people to learn that they have such little experience on. So for me, it's also recognizing the greatness I see in each person, right? That's why I be, I stayed with Tony for so long because that's what we do. Every person has this greatness inside of them. So you have many more than just one superhero power. You have many. Just give me one or two. Planning. Researching. Some of you will read these and go, that is definitely not me. 
<laughs> right? That's like opposite. Some people are like researching, oh, like I'm experiential. I just want to dive in and do things, right? <laughs> but that's another area we could spend a couple hours on, just that alone. Uh, what they're called meta programs and how we filter in our brain. Yeah, so, so Margo. You know, Margo and the researcher might not exactly line up, but you need to have both on all teams, right? But it's important to recognize this. And I want you to understand something. When you are in your, doing your superhero powers, when you are exercising in your job, that's when you're the most happy. That's when you're the most passionate. That's when you think things are on fire, right? Give me a thumbs up if that's true. Right? And also notice this, when you are in your superhero powers, you are what's called an A player, right? You are getting A player results. When I worked with over 20 something years of these hiring managers, they always ask me, I want a person who's passionate and a person who's an A player. I'm surrounded by B players. If you are right now surrounded by B players, that's because you are being a B leader. You haven't found the superhero powers of your team. You, all you need to do is ask them. Right now, there are people in your teams languishing because they're not able to use their superhero powers on a daily basis. In fact, as leaders, a lot of the coaching I do is making sure that I, my people, the, the, the executives I work with, are we're in staying in their superhero powers. There's a great question that you should ask yourself. The question is not how can this be done? The question is who can I get to get it done? Because if that's not my superhero power, I want to find somebody who that is their Titanic, right? I want them launching into that with every part of their body, their soul, their spirit. And it's not always the things that people are great at. There are too many people out there that are doing challenge, they're, they're solving problems that they hate, but because you have certainty in it, you need them to do it. You keep do, having them do that. And sometimes that person is just yourself. So are you doing that to people in your team right now? They are not exercising. People who leave, it's a, one of these is a big reason is they're not exercising their superhero powers. So how important is it for you to understand, just go like your next one-on-one -on -one with somebody is to figure out what their superhero power is. Okay. And they have many. Make sure that they're doing them almost on a daily basis if possible. Make sure you are using your superhero powers on a daily basis. You should not be doing things that are not in your superhero power. You must be moving them off your plate as soon as possible because you will do them much less efficiently, much less happily with worse results than somebody who could go in there and make it happen. Okay, so now let's move on to step two. So these are the th these three, the leadership styles, the culture framework, superhero powers. These three, you must ask everybody in your organization Everybody that you're about to thinking about hiring, you need to ask them these questions. There's no right or wrong. There's no way to lie. If you brought in everybody who loved your leadership style, the main ones that you use, you're going to have, it's going to be easy for you. You have existing teams already. They're going to be all over the place, but you need to find out. And that's what you need to up, up your, your own leadership game. You need to do things that you're weak in, that you're not great at and on the leadership style because that's what's required as a leader. And you'll do it. As soon as you focus on it, you'll get it done. Now, things that are outside your superhero powers, have other people do those. Okay, so let's identify. So identifying who you have, so we've been talking about that along the way, right? So this one, this part, the step two is fast. Like use your one-on-one -on -one meetings to talk about these things. Work with them to understand how you can be a better leader for them. Work with them to understand how you can help them be shining stars, to be A players, right? So that you can get the best result for the organization. This is how those companies got 756% higher net revenue, higher net income. Because they, identified, they, they didn't use these, right? They use their own ways to empower and bring people up. But I'm giving you very specific ways to do that. These are just three things you can do. Be open to receiving feedback because what we see is not what they see. What we perceive is not what they perceive. They, are, they will tell you, if you are, allow people to voice their opinion, you must understand that's real for them. And you must, as a leader, we must understand that. We don't defend it, we don't fight it, we understand it, right? 
That's so critical. And very, and the number, the percentage of leaders that do that is a lot lower. Be an uncommon leader. And then you understand what makes an A player are people in these, like that are living these three things, right? They are living in the right culture framework. They're having the right leader uh, leadership styles lead them and they are doing their superhero powers every day. That's when you get an A player. That's when we are A players. I've always, I, I've not, and I'll be honest, I haven't always been an A player. Even in my own companies, times that I've burnt out, times that I just try to do too much of things that I didn't like or that didn't fit my wheelhouse. Yeah, I just, I dragged. But those are the standards we set, right? Like we said, culture is all about the standards we set and enforce. And if I'm going to say it's all about the who, I need to allow that for everybody else in my organization. I need to empower them to understand that they should be living in their superhero power and we should be moving tasks around to people that really enjoy those tasks. Step three, how do you measure it? So I came up with this acronym I call VABL. So there's so the areas that we need to set standards are values, attitudes, beliefs, behaviors, accountability, acknowledgement, and language, right? So the values are the values that you set. We have a, a way to do it where you actually have the whole organization do it together, right? I, I like that the most because I, as a democratic leader using that style, I want to create consensus within an hour to an hour and a half and then have people own it. I don't want to tell them, I want them to create it themselves and they own it together, right? On a scale of one to 10, Create a sticky and drop it next to the to each one of these. And where is your company right now on a scale of one to 10 in each of these areas? Are your values set? Are they visible? Are they talked about? Are they enforced? Are people doing it without you being there? Same with attitudes. How are you liking the attitudes on the team? Are they generally positive? Are they good to each other? Are they, is there a lot of friction? Is there pain? Is there suffering? <laughs> What's going on in the company, right? On the belief side, What do people actually believe? Is it an us versus them as far as leadership goes? Do they hate their cl your clients? Do they love your clients? Do they, are they enjoying working with each other? Are they not? How are they acting, right? The behaviors, how are they acting with each other? How are they acting to like leadership and, and the teams, teams to clients, leadership to clients? that triangle, right? Well, how are every, how is everybody behaving with each other? Now, here is a different, okay, so accountability is a, is a, is a big topic for me. Accountability for most people is painful. Accountability means typically that somebody didn't get something done and they need to be held accountable, right? So I have a, I'm going to, before you fill, it, fill out the accountability, I'm going to propose a new definition of accountability. The accountability I, we teach our companies that we work with is how do we get people to get the best of everybody else. How do I, if I see Zaina or Zaina sees me having a bad day, how as like Zaina's accountability is to help lift me up. If I see somebody in my company having a hard day, I'm gonna go for, I'm gonna drop everything else. I'm gonna figure out what's going on with them. I'm gonna make sure that whatever we can do to help them, we help them, right? That's the different level, like kind of, if, tell me if that is your accountability in your company. How accountable are your people to lifting each other up? How often do they do it? That's the number I want to see. I'm not talking about just self-discipline and getting some results. I'm talking about looking out for each other. That's the accountability I want in every company. Because if you go look at successful companies, that's what they do.
Acknowledgement is probably the worst one out of all the companies I go to. Acknowledgement is the worst, especially as entrepreneurs, because we very rarely acknowledge ourselves. If we hit a milestone is yay for about five seconds and okay, what do I got to do next, right? And if that's what we do, we don't do it for our teams and they need it from us. That's where most companies fall flat on their face is the acknowledgement. And it's so easy, just like with Zena's dog, right? It's so easy for a dog to come up to you and just give you a little bit of love. That's it. And look, her face tells you everything, right? That's what people are looking for. Even small little bits of acknowledgement, just like that. What a great example at the right time. <laughs> Your dog came in at the right time, Jana. <laughs> but understand this is the human psychology behind all of it, right? If you want to get the most out of your teams, the most out of your people, you acknowledge them over and over again. You make it a practice to acknowledge yourself. It's the standard that you hold. You celebrate things. And just like with, uh, you know, like with, um, um, with Andre, right? Was it Andre or was it Sergey? So I think it was Sergey. Sergey, you know, with, the, with banking, right? Focus on the things that you can celebrate for. It's so easy for us to go the opposite direction. So easy, because we're our own harshest critics. And the last one is like, what language, what are the language people are using together? Is it a language of being positive? Is it a language of being unresourceful or negative? Are people gossiping? Right? What are the standards we're holding? Okay, so now you got that now. So this is actually how, I'm oh, sorry, before I go to this, this is how we measure companies. We go through a whole, like, you know, we stay with them every month. We send them surveys, all their people surveys. They answer specific questions. They answer these seven for sure. And there's usually two or three more every month. It takes about five minutes. And now, like, on a scale of one to 10, they're seeing if what they're putting into play like if they say, okay, I want to improve my culture by, you know, hey, hey, I want to have like, you know, free drinks. I want to have like a refrigerator full of food, right? Then you can actually see if it's making a difference. Are the numbers going up or down? What's happening? Otherwise, there's no way to measure it, right? So this is a fairly easy way to do it. We do it for these companies because they want an, an anonymity. <laughs> they want to not be known as the person answering. So we give them a third party way to do that. Right. And they also have ways to comment a long form as well. So we get some great insights into the company and we share this information with the leadership. So they see, OK, here's where we're going. Right. We're doing things. You know, we tried this. It's not really going anywhere. Let's give it another month. If it's not working, we're going to scrap it and replace it with something else. Other people will give their comments on it and they'll let them know whether they feel it's working or not. So make sure you do this, though. Talk to them about the ask them questions right along here. You can measure your culture. So what can be out there to stop you? Hang on. Okay. What will stop you from having elite teamwork? You mismatching with the first three, right? People not doing their superhero powers. They're not in the right framework. They were hired in totally blind and improperly. And then leadership in companies that have no experience in dealing with the challenges that they're having, because you know what, you were really great at doing this job, but now you've got all these people. It's like, oh my God, these are people. But you haven't been taught tools. Right? Some people, some companies have no leadership or human, human psychology training. And that's so, that's the most important thing you're going to do. Unless you find that you can be just a one person company, that's fine. But most companies aren't that way. You know, and also your hiring managers have never been trained on how to interview people. And that's the case for like hundreds of companies I've worked with. None of them were ever trained on how to interview. And this is a really lightweight, easy framework to actually do it. And you can get great results because it's a transparent way. I mean, by asking those three questions, was it easy for you guys, right? Was it like a great exploration into, oh my gosh, this is the way that I really liked working. When you interview people this way, it's the same. They get the same experience. And then the last one, this is the most important thing. If your team, if you and your team or your team are questioning intent, you will lose every bit of your organization. It'll, it'll just disappear in just like that. 
if somebody did something that had a really bad consequence, a really bad result, and leaders are coming down on that person because of that, instead, like, un, instead of understanding what the intent was and actually talking to them about through it, it will absolutely destroy all trust. That person will be gone, right? They'll leave. The questioning of intent is one of the most powerful things that leaders have to, have to have a great standard of. And that's it. So this is my contact information. If you have any questions, I'm in the Slack. You can email me, you can in, like, you send, like message me in, in, uh, in LinkedIn, but I am here for any questions that you guys might have. And it is, it's, a, it's a honor and privilege to serve this community. And Zaina, thank you so much for the opportunity to, to make that happen. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm, uh, I really like this interactive uh, session. Cool. Yeah, this, I, I like doing it this way because everybody can stay involved and nobody's sleeping. Well, at least I can't tell because they're not on camera. <laughs> <laughs> That's a little tricky. Uh, I think we already have a question in the chat and uh, uh, sure. from Legal Notes. Uh, what is the right way to, to ask to test where a type of per person is? Yeah, so, so I, I think I can I just quickly add on to that. Sorry, I, I think I put it on in the chat at the very beginning, but it, the question states. So really, my question is about uh, checking those cultural values during the interview, because I believe that, for example, in our company, the cultural values are quite uh, public. So if the person just wants to fit in, they can give those socially, uh, you know, um, correct answers and tell right. me what I potentially want to hear. So how do you test it without Kind of if I just give them the answer, they'll tell me teamwork and like everything I want to hear. But how do you test it kind of um, more? The question is to always ask why, right? It's one thing to say it. It's another thing to say whether or not, you know, why it's, it is. So when I usually, so that is another question in the 15 that I do is we cover values. And the question I ask is like, and you think about the companies that you love the most, what were the values? Right. What were the values in those companies that were that were this like you know enforced that were standardized behind be, between everybody? And if they haven't had an example like that, they can actually pick an example of a company that they've seen in the media, right? Or what their impression is. Oh, I'd love to work with that company because they've been transparent. I've never worked with a company that's been transparent before. And then you ask them why, right? If it's they're transparent, then it's because you know we they didn't tell us, and then we had this huge layoff, blah blah blah. So they got in, typically it's injury, right? Some kind of injury that causes that some kind of pain so so that's what i would do i always so there's a great study in statistic 81 percent of people lie in an interview just like you said margarita they'll look it up they just spout back what you're telling them 80 so doing it this way this is the confident confident fit interview process there is no line it's just what they love right find out what they love and they love talking about it. And you can tell this, like my, my son with the Titanic, he just like, he'll just start, if he walked in here right now, he'd just start blurting out all the Titanic stats he has, right? That's Amazing. SolidWorks, that's the software. And he'll show you how many times he sunk it just to see how, like why it was such a bad design, right? <laughs> and so it's just, you'll, you'll get that from people. When they start talking this way, they, 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 there's no lying anymore. It's just, they understand you're trying to get them into a place where they can shine my place is not going to shine for everybody. If somebody is like super like ultra competitive, they're not gonna find a great place here, right? It's just not my style. But I know that there's a great place for them. They need to go and I can tell them, hey, go to Amazon. Netflix has this and on Netflix's website, they say, you know, we like, you know, we are, a we are not a family. We're a team of high performing individuals. If you are not a high performing individual, you will not work at Netflix, right? That's what they say. So you can actually see it from all the different companies out there that they have this, they have a specific framework they want to follow. So I so said, did that answer? I'm sorry, did that answer your question? No, that, that definitely did. Thank you so much. This is great. Yeah, if I may, just a really quick second question sure. about leadership training. How huh? do you, uh, about leadership training? So you mentioned that this is something that startups should do. Yes. So my question is when is, to, when is best to implement it? At what level do you start with founders or do you start with uh, kind of uh, managers as well? Uh, what is the best way to implement it? And where do you go for that leadership training? Thank you so much. 
I think a lot of the uh, companies that I think Zena has brought together here, a lot of people do leadership training, right? We, tre we teach across what, like the things that I'm teaching you right now, we teach leadership across these concepts. So it's a very straightforward, like, you know, and I, I don't think there are very few other companies that actually teach it this way. But what I found is that, hey, if people hire the grade this way, then why not teach them, like, if, if I can teach leaders to get people to be their best in a very easy way, then they can get great results. Why not, right? That should be the easiest way to do it. So there are these pieces and then there's uh, like, and when, as soon as you can, honestly, because like every, like the, the like just with, with any organization, the, the, the fewer mistakes that are made during like, you know, the opportunity to go into hyper growth, the better. And all you have to do is if you like, how many leaders do you have on your team right now, Margarita? You have like, like existing leaders and then you'd have emerging leaders as well. But how many existing leaders do you have in your, in your company? Um, how do you define a leader? Is it the founder or is it someone who is already like a manager in a company? Yeah, people like typically people who are leading other people, right? So founders all the way through your, your like some people are just starting off. So there's just a couple of people that's, you know, so everybody's kind of a leader <laughs> overall, but in, in companies that have grown a little bit like how many managers do you have or even i would say teams? i would say can, uh, counting founders we have five leaders okay five leaders ask them has any of them ever had any kind of human psychology or leadership training right fastest way to find out so. okay you we don't know right the only training we've gotten typically is from our parents or from previous bosses and whether or not that's good training or not we have no idea but if they want to commit themselves to making other people better, then let's give them the tools, right? Like today is just simple tools. It should be that easy. It should be very easy to consume and very easy to implement. Thank you so much. It's You're been welcome. a great lecture. Thank you. Uh, okay, another question from the chat and this is from Sergey. Uh, could one company fit one, uh, two or more cultural types? Well, certainly the, the answer to that is yes, because it's happening every day, right? Every company, if they're not clear about the standard or the kind of people that they want to hire, they have put people in all kinds of different roles, just like my friend who is the VP that got hired into Amazon, right? He's a teamwork guy, but his style of management is not going to work for a long while. He could work, but it's Amazon is a competitive-based environment, right? So you can have multiple, like I used to run my sales team as ultra-competitive, I used to run my ultra, my operations team as more individual until I realized what I was doing. And then I just wanted to, because I enjoyed number three, I just wanted to hire number three. So the answer is yes, it could. Um, typically teamwork and individual merit are usually the most combat, combat, uh, uh, compatible. Ultra competitive and teamwork are painful. That's oil and water, right? If they like, they'll start, you know, like this, usually the, the ultra competitive will constantly being down talking the teamwork group. If you've ever seen that happen. Like if you, I mean, obviously like a lot of us have worked in big, larger organizations. So you actually get to see some of this play out. The, the ultra competitive team will always be pooping on the teamwork team. Sometimes vice versa, but usually it's that direction. You know, they just thought, oh, they, they, you know, all those teamwork, that's blah, 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 that's all BS, right? So that's what they'll say. Does that make sense? Uh, so th there is no uh, way uh, to combine. I mean, uh, maybe it should be different uh, teams in one company, uh, which has have uh, different cultures. You could. It I'm saying you can, you can do anything. The question is why? Uh -huh. Why would you want it that way? Okay, maybe sales uh, department should be competitive. So Stick I was, I, so sorry, I was in like, when I was 24 years old, I got hired into recruiting, right? And it took him six months to hire me because they thought this kid, like well, what 40 year old is gonna take career advice from this kid, this 24 year old kid, right? So it took him six months to decide, hey, we're gonna hire this guy. So that first year I had a manager who was a pace setter and a commander. I didn't know where his hand ended and where my butt began, <laughs> right? So, so everything, like I, we did everything together. It was like 80 hours a week. We were working, drinking, playing, exercising, doing everything together. 
and by this the second the second year um, I had uh, I, by that first year I was uh, number two rookie in the West for a nationwide firm, and by the end of the second year I was in the top ten percent. But I'm a number three guy. All they did was tell me, "Here's the targets. Go to, go make it happen." I didn't need to be compared to anybody else, right? So what I'm telling you is that sale, like, and I and that's what I thought sales should be that way too. Except it doesn't have to be that way. Each person runs themselves differently. That's what I'm trying to explain, right? So find the salespeople that like. If I like number three. I want to find salespeople that love number three too. I just give them targets. I give them leads. They just go make it happen. I don't need to compare them to anybody else. I don't need to have them. Now they can compare and compete and they can have fun with that, but I don't need it to be the driving factor, right? There are some salespeople that love that. There are other salespeople that are, are motivated. Some like we, I had a group of salespeople. There are four of them that said, Hey, I want to take like we all want to take a piece of our commissions that we make, our individual commissions, put it into a pool to share with each other. I'm like, this is like, like you, I thought it should be ultra competitive, right? I'm like, this is ridiculous. Like, well, this is so like, I've never heard of this before. That's actually what got me started on researching this. And so we put that program into place for them. Those four together, what they did was incredible. Like they, they love supporting each other. They felt like they were a community within the whole group, right? They felt that, Hey, look, every work, everything that I do helps my teammates. My teammates are helping me. I love that environment. I'm going to work 10 times harder in this environment. Does that make sense? Yeah, now I got it. Thank yes. You. So you have to find out what drives each individual person. You decide what kind of people you want to work with. Because if you have these too many of these things, like they, they clash. If you have everybody who's in it, like Zappos is a great example of this. They're an independent contributor. Zappos Im implemented Holacracy. They eliminated almost all of their management. But this is after years of studying it and moving forward. And like, they are one of the, the biggest proponents of like pushing culture and understanding how to hire for it, right? They hire for it really, really well. But they know exactly what they want. And it's not a mishmash. It's, it's like we want people who are resourceful. In that company, if I'm like the, uh, the HR person, I can walk over to the IT guy uh, and to ask him, hey, look, can we implement a new HR system? Then we go together. We go talk to the finance person, make sure we have enough money to do it. Then boom, it gets it, like we build the teams, it gets done, and then we go our separate ways. I don't need a boss to talk to his boss, right, to, to, to talk to each other. But that's, the, that's what happens when you're aligned. You can have a whole company full of like a like multi-billion dollar company all aligned like that. And there's there's massive power when there's no friction. Does that make sense? Yeah, now it's clear. Thank you okay. very much. You're very welcome. Uh, okay. Uh, go ahead. And no, no, go ahead then. Uh, all right. Uh, so next question from the chat as well is uh, what can you recommend for organizations that has founders with different culture frameworks? One and two. Okay. So this is a, uh, this is really, okay. I would say that this is like the most important decision, like in, in the entrepreneur is who to bring in as advisors and who to bring in as partners, right? Because if you bring in an advisor that has a completely different cultural framework, they will continue to put pressure on you in ways that you don't want. And it's the same thing, like if you have a founder that if you haven't vetted, it's like, it's like when you go out on a date and you're really attracted to somebody, but you have no idea who they really are. It's first date syndrome, right? You know, we're perfect in front of other people. I never fart, right? Until, until I married my wife. <laughs> and so, so this is actually, a, a Carol, is a much deeper question. It's making sure that number one, you stay, you both have the same outcome. You both understand the frameworks that you're in. And you can talk to each other through the like be like in between the frameworks, right? It's like I know he's super competitive. Let me let me understand his viewpoint for a second. I know it's uncomfortable for me. It's not the way that I like to operate, but I need to find common ground because he is my founder already. And that's that is a tough thing to do. It can, or I should say it, it can be tough, but with these community like the things that we teach, the communication styles, I'd be happy to talk to you offline about it. But just to get to a place where you both are like you know working together well. It's obviously that's like the biggest amount of stress that you could possibly have is having your founder pushing things in a way that you're not happy with. Uh, okay, upcoming question is uh, from Tatiana and 
uh, what to do with micromanagement, with micromanagement and top management behavior. Right. So that's so the, those are commanders, right? So the, they they have a command structure. A lot of the old school companies, old school leaders are very command focused. And the answer is, uh, yeah, I mean, you understand what I so the question is, how do you gain influence with people that you may not think you have influence with, right? And part of that is to understand their intent behind. And it's the same thing with uh, the Corolla. Here's here's the part of an answer for you too. Understand the intent they have behind what they do. It's not a bad intent. It feels bad because it's not the way that you want to be led. But it's not a bad intent. Understand the intent and go talk to them about the intent, and then talk to them about how if they could do it this way and they can get more out of you, right? So yeah, you know, you're doing a lot of micromanagement. I totally get it. You want to have the certainty behind making sure things happen here, here, and here. If we can try this out, let me see if I can get you better results. If you just drop in every like every week, or just like if you just cover these things, or if you if you don't do this, then I'll get you better results, right? And then show them you can get better results. And that's how you can change behavior. You have to understand the intent, right? So the questioning of intent, like I said before, is the thing that destroys all companies. It destroys all organizations. Understand the intent of what they really want. You have to get inside their head. And this, again, this is the importance of understanding human psychology, right? Is to understand like, you know, like how to read what they're saying and get underneath it to find out what they really want. Give that to them in a way that you can perform the best. And I'll be like, oh, okay, I don't have to do this with her. You're welcome. Any other questions? There is one more. Uh, what to do with micromanagement in top management behavior? Oh yeah, we just uh, we just covered that one real quick. Oh, sorry, I probably uh, missed it. Then. By the way, no more questions. Uh, one other thing, for those people, okay, so like for for Carol, for Tatiana, for everybody. If you have a person that you are having friction with right now, and that's pretty much everybody, right? I want you to do this. I want you to think of the five things that you appreciate most about that person. If you want to stop questioning intent, this is what you need to do. Here's an exercise that I built years ago. Think about five things you truly appreciate about that person. And some, for some people, this takes time. There's a lot of pain involved. And I know you can because you're a leader and a human being is that there are five things that I can truly understand about this person without saying the word, but like Zena is a great leader, but right. It just erased the whole Zena is a great leader. Never use the word, but it just erases everything you said before. So understand like, Hey, you know, let me think about that. Oh, that person, you know, they, they are a good commander. They're really good at being a commander. That could be one thing, or they really care about the results that they're getting. Right. They want to make sure that everything's right. And there's pain behind that. There's typically pain behind every behavior every person is doing. They want to avoid the pain so that they've created this part, these behaviors. But understand the five things that you really appreciate about them. And it may show you a different, a different way to view them. It may show you a different way. To, and then what you do after that is you take them out to a meal or you have a meeting with them and that's all you tell them are the five things you really appreciate about them. And see what that does for your relationship. This can be done outside of work too, by the way. And then don't say no, no buts, no, oh, but you didn't do this, you didn't do that. Forget about all that stuff. Just see them for who they are as a human being. Give, like, give, them, some, give them what you see and what you appreciate. And then just have a great meal around it, and then just see what see what changes. Uh, that's a great tactic. <laughs> it's just it's a tool. It's, it's for us to remind ourselves. Every like, if you want to influence other human beings, you need to understand them first. And we are always being influenced either in a good way or a bad way, right? So let's do it for good. Let's do good things with it. Okay, very cool. Uh, does anybody have more questions? You can just unmute and ask. 
Um, but actually, meanwhile, while we're waiting for other questions, I will just want to make a very quick announcement that uh, this is actually our 12th session. And uh, we will be pausing for about a month or a month and a half and picking up in September again. So, yeah. So uh, just, uh, yeah, sorry, just know that the mural board will stay up. So you guys can come back and look at this uh, content at any time you want. Just hang on to the link. I will, I will put the link in uh, Slack as well. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. You guys are so welcome. And just, just connect with me on Slack and, uh, and ask me any questions that you may have that pop up in the next couple of days. Mm -hmm. Okay, then, Felix, thank you very, very, very much. This was a very interesting uh, session, very interactive. Cool. Thank you for uh, giving me the space to, to, to spread the word. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Thank you, everybody. And, and good luck with everything on, on your side of the world. We're all praying for you. Thank you.